So good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Evangelos Liatsikos, and today we will spend uh, some time together talking about the PCNL prone approach. The webinar works uh, as follows. We have about 30 minutes presentation, and I will be responding to your questions, and uh, we can have a, some kind of exchange of, uh, of your uh, questions with my answers. Uh, these are my um, disclaimer. This is my disclaimer. I'm a consultant with Cook Medical and a lecturer with uh, three companies. And let's start now with the concept of uh, PCNL in prone position. First of all, a lot of people uh, consider uh, a big problem the radiation on your hands. So there are ways and uh, tricks to avoid radiation on your hands. So you don't need to have a hand grasping the needle. You can actually hold the plaque or you can hold the grasper as you saw in the video. It's up to you to see uh, what kind of exposure you want to have, and there's certainly a way around it. Now, when you put a, uh, do a, a, a prone position, clearly you need to put the urethral catheter in and supine and then rotate the patient. You don't need a lot of people to rotate the patient, as you see here. People need to be knowing what they're doing. And then you need to put a bolster on each side. Note the bolster goes on the lateral side of the patient. We don't want anything to occupy the abdomen of the patient, so the patient can actually breathe nicely and smoothly. This table, note the table, this is a carbon fiber table, which you will be able to, you, to move with your hand manually. So you don't need to move the C-arm, you move the table. Fix the patient on the table, because if you push during your dilation uh, and the patient is obese, they could fall off the table and you don't want that. It happens in the best families. So then you use a drape and you're ready to go. Make your anesthesiologists happy, so let them use any kind of pillows, cushions they want to be able to be secure with their tubings, their spiral tubings. Let them do what they want. They will not bother you once you don't bother them, so make them happy on that. That's uh, up to them to do whatever they want. PCNL equipment you need is not expensive, so there's no excuse that you cannot do PCNL because it's an expensive procedure. You need the basic stuff, you need a nephroscope, you need dilators, and a lithotripsy device and some wires, and that's it. So you really need to have a nice and, ni uh, nice and neat table, and uh, with minimal equipment, you can do a great, great job. You can choose your dilators. You have different choices. You have a choice to have a metallic dilators, the alkene dilators, polymeric dilators, or you can have balloon dilators. It's up to you, and it's up to your to the system that uh, you know is you feel more confident in your hands. I personally favor the the polymeric dilators because I find them much more handier. Not for any other reason. Uh, I know people that use uh, metallics and uh, people that use the balloon. The concept of the bullseye now. This is the patient in a prone. So this is a, a slice of the body in a prone position. You see that the kidney is rotated 40 degrees, 30 to 40 degrees towards the lateral side where the surgeon is going to be. So at this point, the C-arm will rotate 30 degrees towards the surgeon. The surgeon is, in the, is on the left of the screen, and the needle needs to go in parallel, coaxially, with the C-arm axis, and this is the side of insertion. Then the depth of insertion will be regulated by the C-arm rotating to zero degrees. You need two axes to do this thing, so that's how it's done. You connect your urethral catheter with an um, extension tube, so you don't need to be close to the patient. You inject contrast, and then what you do is you rotate the C-arm 30, 30 degrees, as we discussed previously, to be able to check where your needle will go. So the site of insertion is regulated at 30 degrees. If your needle goes too deep and you see this in vertical, do not inject contrast because you have extravasation and this is what you get. You don't want that. Aspirate. Never inject contrast when you're not sure that you're inside the system. Uh, injecting contrast creates chaotic situations inside and sometimes it could even, even be difficult to dilate or to get access to your kidney. I repeat, we rotate the CRM 30 degrees, we advance our needle in a coaxial way and this gives you the direction of puncture by going in. You will see this, that the side of puncture is exactly the side where we want the, thing, the, 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 the 30 degrees access to, to get access to the kidney. We advance the needle in a coaxial way, so the theoretical bullseye would be hub and tip, same point, 
uh, just that doesn't always happen. But then once you make sure that you're almost there, you rotate the C-arm vertical to be able to check your depth. Now, you do not control the depth at 30 degrees. So sometimes you're not too deep or you need to go deeper inside. Trying to proceed to the next slide. There we go. So you rotate the C-arm to zero degrees and you see that at this point you're in. You take the trocar of the needle out and you see that you have contrast coming out. This is contrast that the nurse or your assistant is injecting from the ureteral catheter. If that is not the case and you're too deep, you just in aspirate and pull back your needle. If you're not deep enough, you just rotate the C-arm again at 30 degrees and advance in again. So once you see the contrast coming out, the first goal is to pass the hydrophilic wire down the ureter. Passing a hydrophilic wire down the ureter is of paramount importance to do a safe procedure and to do a good dilation. This is very, very important. The hydrophilic guide wire is called hydrophilic because it slips nicely down, but it also has a big problem. It can slip out easily. So it needs to be exchanged. So at this point, you incise the skin only at this point you incise the skin. You incise the skin, make sure to incise it to accommodate the diameter of sheath you have decided to, to use. So if you want to use a 30 French sheath, you need to incise the skin at least 30 French. There's no meaning of having friction when you're dilating on your skin. Now over this hydrophilic wire, you will advance a stiff dilator, eight or 10 French, which will inadvertently go down the ureter. You need this so you can exchange this wire. This wire is very soft. Even if you use a stiff hydrophilic wire, it is not the best case to be able to dilate. If you have uh, difficult situations, you will not be able to dilate them nicely. You see that the, the, the dilator is going down the ureter. You just pull out your wire and you exchange it with a nice uh, stiff wire, the stiffest you can find in your market. The one I favor is this. This one is the, the Lunderquist. Uh, it's a nice stiff, very stiff wire, but make sure to insert always the floppy part of the wire inside. If you make a mistake to insert the stiff part of the wire, it's like a knife. So you don't want that. You insert the wire down the ureter because it goes down the ureter because the catheter is down the ureter. You extract the dilator. And then the next step is you start your dilation. How do we do the dilation? This is a 30 French final dilation. So in, uh, as, as I mentioned in the beginning, I, I favor the polymeric dilators. This is an eight French stiff catheter that is in the set of the polymeric dilators. It goes over your wire down the ureter, half stays in, half, half goes out, half stays out of the, of the body. And the dilation will be a two-step dilation. So first we start with 16 French, and then we go to 30 French. Now, if your dilation this is a 16 French dilator. As you see, the dilation needs to be parallel, always under fluoroscopic guidance, parallel to your wire. Your finger needs to be very close to the skin. So when you do the dilation process, what happens is that if you make any kind of mistake and you push too hard, then your finger stops your dilator from damaging the, uh, something that shouldn't damage. So like going too far deep inside, damaging vessels or stuff like that. As you see here, very important, the finger does a lot of work. So 16 goes in, no contrast in the kidney. You don't ask for contrast because if you take the 16 out and you have contrast inside the kidney, all that contrast extravasates. Next step is you go in with a 13. In this case, it's a 30. Otherwise, if you want to go with smaller diameters, you can go in with a smaller diameter. When you insert the 30 inside, then you ask for contrast injection because then you will not take this out. You will put, out, you will put in the final sheath. So as you see here, you want to create some space to nicely accommodate this, uh, this dilator. After you position the dilator in place, you need to, in, to insert now the outer sheath. Now the outer sheath is inserted by holding the, the, the dilator and by uh, screwing in clockwise or anti-clockwise your, your sheath. You follow that, you follow that, you check the fluoroscopy because you don't want to, in, to advance the sheath in too deep uh, because otherwise you will damage structures again. Inject contrast, you ask your nurse or your assistant to inject contrast while your sheath is going in, and that's it. And things are going nicely. Uh, you see it gradually, and just to make sure that you're in position, you pull back your uh, inner sheath, and you have your sheath in position. You pull back also the black 
uh, di dilator and you have a wire going down the ureter and a sheath ready to go. So this is your working wire and your security wire at the moment. You, you know, you make sure that your assistant holds that. Now there is a debate about the punctures and about the papillary puncture and about the dogma that you should always go through the papilla. Uh, there's great work done by Sampaio many years ago showing that the, the safe way to do a PCNL is to go through a papilla. I must say that a couple of years ago, quite a few years ago actually, uh, going through a papilla created a huge bleeding for me. So I started, I started questioning whether this is the right way of doing it and whether you know, I should bother to go through papilla and spend more time to go through an access which was more difficult for me. So, and you need to keep in mind that kidneys are different, the anatomies are different. Not all the kidneys are like in the books. You have kidneys where the papillas are very small. Look at this kidney, for example, the next, the next one, the next video that I'm going to show you here. This one on the right, look at those papillas and those infundibula there. They are so small, so tough to go through that system. You know, it's much more easier to go more medially. So we tried moving more medially towards the kidney with the aim to pass the wire down the ureter. That's our main concern, to pass that wire down the ureter. And once that is done, then the case is very safe. We proved that with different publications and different, uh, you know, studies that this is a safe way to go, prospective, randomized, whatever. And most of you probably have heard about this technique. Look at this case here, for example. This is a a stone in the anterior and posterior calyx of the lower uh, system. If you go on the papilla of the posterior calyx, you will never be able to reach the anterior calyx. So if you go in the middle of the two, you bend your scope either ways and you can deal easily with the situation. Plus, your wire goes down the ureter much easier. Now look at the endoscopic view. This is a papillary puncture that you're gonna see here now. It goes right through the papilla. You see the puncture, everything is nicely seen. Check the non-papillary puncture now. It comes to the pelvis, through the parenchyma. Same thing, it gives you more mobility and you can move your scopes easier and do your job faster and easier inside. Just to show you a diagram, this would be the puncture through the posterior calyx. Most of the times the stone is impacting that calyx and the wire cannot pass down the ureter. And then you have those fragments in the anterior calyx, as I said, that you would probably use the flexible. You'd need the flexible ureteroscope to go in a combined procedure and grab them out because it's impossible from that angle to, to, to bend to the anterior calyx. So in, in this case, what we're proposing is you go directly down the ureter with the, your wire, you're in the pelvis, and look at this. This is the calyx in the lower, this is obstructed infundibula, full of stones. You come closer to it. You put your lithotripter inside. The stone is trapped. It can't go anywhere. So you break it and you, know, you start aspirating the fragments. And then you start coming closer again to create some space for your scope to go inside without tearing anything very gently because the water is injected and the water creates this whole, this whole situation by itself. So little trip to get inside, you create some space and then it starts working nicely. And you will see that gradually now you go in with your scope and you know everything is trapped all the stones there are trapped with your lithotripter you don't need to use graspers or anything you just go in with your lithotripter aspirate it and it's very very important to have a lithotripter with a suction today nowadays you have a couple of companies having this uh, opportunity and it really saves your day that you really go in break and aspirate and you see that in, in a few seconds you clear the stones and there's no way those stones can escape and go anywhere now once you're in, one of the, uh, you, you need an ephroscope, passive irrigation. You don't need any pumps or any, any uh, you know, forceful irrigation, only pass, uh, passive irrigation. And you just need an ultrasonic lithotripter or a lithotripter that is, can aspirate. As you see here, it breaks the stone and aspirates the stone at the same time. No time for fragment removals or anything like that. You just use your lithotripter and it works perfectly. And just to show you again, this is the wire going down the ureter here. See, to show you how efficient this, this whole thing is. You move to the lower calyx slowly. You retract your scope, you move to the lower calyx. And in this case, you have remnants from probably shockwave lithotripsy that you want to get rid of. So you go in, you advance your lithotripter. Your lithotripter is sucking out some of those fragments. And then you go in with your scope, see the fragments and aspirate them 
in seconds. No way they can go anywhere. They are trapped. So you're hitting the calyx, the stones towards the calyx papilla. So there's no way they can go anywhere. And you're done with it very fast. One of very interesting trick, safety trick, is once you go in and you see the urethral catheter, you just grasp it and pull it out. You pull it out from the from your sheath, and then your nurse is holding one one end, you're holding the other end. You pull out your wire completely, you pass it through the urethral catheter. Once the nurse or your assistant receives the wire from the urethra side, he or she pulls out the urethral catheter, and you put a grasper at the urethra side and a grasper at the nephrostomy side. And this is your security, working wire, and everything. Nothing can go wrong once you have a wire like that. Now, when you're using a lithotripter, things can, uh, you, you, you can be dealing with soft stones or you can be dealing with hard stones. In any case, those lithotripters, and now specific lithotripters that are using combiner energy, will break the stone for sure. You just need to take your time and you know you don't need to lose time to grasp stones and pull them out. You just aspirate, break, and aspirate. All stones will break for sure. There's no stone that uh, doesn't break with these kind of lithotripters. So at the end of the procedure, uh, you need to put a tube inside and a frosting tube. We favor this kind of uh, malecot tail stent, but you know you could also put a double J stent and a, and a nephrostomy. In this case, the malecot has the advantage of opening nicely inside the pelvis, and then the, the, the segment goes down the ureter, the seven French segment goes down the ureter, but doesn't reach the bladder. So it kind of aligns the whole nephrostomy with the, with the ureter. And then on day three, we keep the patients for three days in the hospital. On day three, we just pull the whole thing out. If you want to send those patients earlier home, you just put a nephrostomy and a double J stent catheter. The reason we prefer this, the malecot, is but most of our patients come from far away, so we just want to send them home without having anything. You inject contrast, you could have some extravasation, you don't care, because this means you had some probably some kind of tear in the pelvis, the stone was too hard, and when you were breaking it, it was actually causing issues. Now, at this point, you need to suture the nephrostomy clearly on the skin, but the, the other point is that you need to push. You see this nicely now, it's going to be sutured, just like a drain, you know, fix it like a drain. And then it is important that the tube is held up. So the assistant is going to be holding up the tube and pushing around the skin incision. It's like a concept of, you know, when your nose is bleeding, you put pressure on your nose so it stops bleeding. Otherwise, you never put your nose down. And, uh, you know, otherwise it would never stop bleeding. So... It's very important to put some, you put some gauzes, some packages there. So when you put some tension, then the patient turns in supine position, then the tube is not obstructed. It bends, but it's not obstructed. And as you see, the tube is, hold, is hold, the assistant is holding the tube up. Again, you fix those gauzes there, and that tube stays at the level of the bed for the first hours after surgery. It is important that the tube, the tube of the nephrostomy, does not go down on the floor because the differences of pressures generate could generate bleeding. This is very important. Uh, if you want to use the balloon, the balloon dilator, as you noticed here, we'll go through the lower calyx with the balloon. But I already have a wire down the ureter from the middle calyx, uh, as you've noticed. The reason is, if the kidney is very mobile, you need to be very careful when you insert the balloon especially in the lower calyx, because the balloon has the problem that if it's not inserted well inside the system, it can really kick you off, kick you off the system. So when the balloon is inflated, it goes towards, the, it moves towards the, play, the, the space of least resistance. So if the least resistance is outside of the kidney, it will really move outside. So the whole process is the same. There are no, no big differences. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> You, you see the contrast coming out, you inject, you insert your wire. The advantage of the balloon is a lot of people prefer it over the, the, the other dilators because you don't really need to dilate. It's a one-step procedure. Problem here is you will see how mobile this thing is. And when, it's, when the balloon goes in, it can really, if you're not careful and you don't know how to do it, it can really create problems for you. The disadvantage of the balloon is if you want to do different punctures, you know, variable punctures, it's very difficult to reuse it in the same patient. You have to uh, bend it, and it's not easy. 
In this case, you see that I have to change the hydrophilic wire again for a stiff wire. Note the kidney, how, how it moves internally. It is really impressive. Now, this is the balloon. Now, a lot of people make the mistake. They insert the balloon and they forget to, to backload the sheath. You need to backload the sheath before you insert the balloon because otherwise there's no chance that you can do it. Two radiopaque markers. One needs to go way inside, as you see that. The other one is outside. The, the one that is inside needs to really go inside because if it's not well inside the system when you are inflating, then it really is going to pop you out and it's gonna, you're going to be dilating outside of the kidney. Uh, easy process. These uh, balloons have a mechanism of a, a high pressure mechanism that you can actually start inflating by clockwise rotation of this syringe. And uh, you will see that gradually you need to hold it. The system needs to hold the balloon because if you don't hold it, it will really come flip out. The system needs to be well dilated. So you need to create space for the balloon to be inflated. And as you see nicely, you control the inflation of the balloon under fluoroscopy to see what kind of resistance you have, uh, how it's moving. And you see it straightens up nicely your track. And you need to be able to see that there are no wrinkles on the balloon and there are not uh, you know, any, any non-inflated segments. Once you do that, you just you know, advance the sheath on a clockwise fashion again. You just screw it over, over the balloon as if it was a dilator. Nothing changes in this case. So, you know, this, uh, as I said, why do I have that wire through the middle calyx? Because if things go bad with the balloon here, I have an access to my kidney. So you deflate the balloon now and you're ready to go again in this case, same scenario. So having described the technique, we must say that, you know, we need to address also the complications because the only surgeon that really doesn't have any complications is the one that doesn't operate. The guy that goes in the morning, drinks his coffee and leaves in the afternoon without doing anything. He doesn't have a chance to have any complications. Everyone else will. So you need to know your complications. You need to discuss with your colleagues regarding the complications and you need to standardize your technique to decrease your complications. Let's go over some complications to see what is happening. Now, we're inside here, the system, it looks, it appears that there is some calluses, but I don't see my wire. I pull back, I pull back, I find my wire, and now under fluoroscopic guidance, I, I continue following my wire inside the system. It is clear that I was not in the system before. I was in a vessel before. So how do I suspect that? I suspected that because I saw blood and I didn't see my wire. So what did I do? I just pulled back, followed my wire in, and that was it. So beware of your wire. Your wire needs to be down the ureter. If you lose your wire when you're doing the dilation, then you can be in trouble. Again, wire down the ureter means you decrease damage to the surrounding vascular structures. When you're dilating and your wire is coiling inside the pelvis or the upper calyx, especially on the right side, if you make a mistake, your injury will go, your dilator will go directly to the renal vein or the vena cava. You don't want that. That's a very bad complication that requires immediate surgical intervention. You want the dilator to have the direction towards the ureter. So if you make a mistake, the mistake will be towards the ureter. Worst case scenario, you will damage the ureter. It's not a life-threatening situation. So the wire down the ureter is something very important you need to do. Now look at this here now. You have a ureteral catheter. You're injecting through the ureteral catheter to do a PCNL access. And suddenly, just by injection, uh, you get a communication with the vascular system. This, you increase the pressure in the, in, in the vein, you have a rupture of the fornix, and you have contrast going directly to the vascular system. You don't do anything particular here. You don't panic. You just do your PCNL through another calyx that is not involved with this communication. But this is very important to show how you can get sepsis, especially after flexible ureteroscopy, when what is happening is you're injecting, contra you're injecting water without seeing the contrast and you have an infected stone. And if you have this kind of communication, then you know, the, it goes directly into the bloodstream and you get sepsis. And that's how we get sepsis after flexible. This is the pathophysiological mechanism. Let's see some cases now. We have a 55 year old male presenting with gross hematuria one month after percutaneous nephrolithotripsy of a staggered calculi of the left kidney. So he left the hospital perfectly in good shape. And then one month later he had Hematuria. You know the diagnosis here. You just need to do a CD scan to document it, but you know that you're talking about a pseudoaneurysm or a AV communication. So you know that in this case, 
you need to be to have a good re interventional radiologist. You can really go in, super selectively embolize it, and finish the case and finish your complication in, a, in an immediate setting. Do not keep those patients in the ward because what happens is they will stay for a couple of days, they will clear up, the urine will clear, but then suddenly they will start bleeding again. So you just find a solution, deal with the complication, and do not uh, insist on keeping him in the ward without doing anything. Another case, 45-year-old male patient subject to PCNL in the right kidney for a big stone, pelvic stone. We put a malicot tail stand inside. The post-operative post course was uneventful. We went over the 12th rib with our puncture, and when we took out the malicot on day three, the patient went into severe pain and uh, respiratory distress. When we go over the 12th rib and we have pain after stent removal, or even before, we always just do an X, a chest X-ray because we always suspect that we had an injury of the pleura. This is the X-ray that we did, and it's clear that on the right, on the base of the right lung, it's full of liquid. What kind of liquid can we have on day three? It can't be blood because it would have been from day one, so it has to be urine. And the concept of why it is urine is the kidney is not drained anymore. The tube was tamponading the pleural injury probably. So when I took out the tube, then urine went into the pleura. How do we treat this now? Certainly you need to treat the kidney as a first thing. So you need to stent the kidney with a double J stent and a Foley catheter or with an nephrostomy. And then you clearly need to drain also the pleura. You cannot risk leaving the pleura as it is because if you are lucky, then it will absorb, the urine will be absorbed. But if you're unlucky, then sepsis, would, you would have an MPM of the lung and you don't want that. So you drain both this, the, the fistula closes, the, you know, the damaged segment will, will heal and nothing goes wrong after that. Now look at this. This is a very interesting case of a female patient where we did a staggering uh, stone on the right side. Um, I insist on that, on the right side. And um, after surgery, we went over the 12th rib with our puncture and after surgery, you had a severe pain on that uh, of, of the patient. So severe pain and over the 12th rib means chest X-ray. This is a chest X-ray we did, and note that this is an image that is involving the left lung, not the right lung. So immediately you need to suspect that something is going wrong that has to do with someone else and not with your involvement. So in this case, do not rush. If you have doubts of what is happening, do a CT scan, whatever, because this is a case where the tube of anesthesia was positioned too deep inside and created massive atelectasia of the left lung. So if you put a tube inside there, you create a huge problem. In reality, you need to do nothing. You just need to use these kind of proper respiratory physiotherapy devices, some medication, and this is what you get the next day. But if, on the other hand, you make the mistake to actually puncture that and put a chest tube, you create a huge damage on the lung, and that's a huge problem, huge complication. Now, what happens if you go in and you see your wire going down the ureter and you see a tear in the middle of your pelvis like this? So your pelvis is torn, you see outside fat, and this is the right kidney here, and we're really afraid. Next door is the vena cava and the renal vein. So at this point, what you do is you just stop. You put a nephrostomy tube inside and come back after a couple of weeks. Everything will have been healed and you can really continue your case. If you continue doing your case here, you risk that the fragments of the stones will go out and then you can have infectious problems. You can have, uh, if you go after them inside the retroperitoneal space, you can end up uh, in the vena cava or into the vascular system and you don't want that, that is a bad complication. Next thing is, in this case, you see this black thing on top of the, of the, of the stone, and you wonder, what is this is foreign body inside the, in the kidney? When you put a hydrophilic wire over an impacted stone, the, the impacted stone acts like a knife over the hydrophilic, the hydrophilic coating. So sometimes it actually tears the whole hydrophilic coating, and this remains inside the kidney, and you actually see it. This is the case in this, in this scenario. So nothing happens, you just take it out. Another case here where you see a nice pelvic stone, the perfect stone for any beginner to start with. So you do your case, you do a very nice case, and at the end you put a nephrostomy, you inject contrast, and you notice that you have a huge contrast outside of your system. And that is not extravasation. 
This is bowel injury. So what did you do wrong? You didn't do a CT scan to realize that there is a retrorenal colon. A CT scan needs to be done always before you do PCNL to see if you have retrorenal colon, if you have hepatomegalia, splenomegalia, so you avoid injuring the uh, nearby organs if you do a CT scan. What do you do in this case now? The books say that what you need to do is separate gas with water. It means that you need to pull back your nephrostomy tube inside the bowel and drain with a, a double J stent and a Foley catheter or a nephrostomy the kidney. This is the correct case, but if for some reason your patient has tenderness, abdominal tenderness and is not doing well, do not hesitate to operate them and resolve the solution once and for all, because if the opening is transperitoneal, you can have a huge problem with having feces and bowel content in the peritoneum, and these people can do very bad and actually die. So you need to be very careful. So at the end of a nice procedure on the right side, you do a CT scan to see if you have any stones, if it's stone-free, and you realize that it's stone-free, but the nephrostomy tube passes through the liver. What do you need to do in this case? First of all, don't panic. Second, leave the tube where it is. You don't pull the tube out. That would be the biggest mistake. You leave the tube in for a couple of weeks, and then you just take it out. Fibrotic tissue will be created. Only in case of instability, of hemodynamic instability, you intervene there surgically. Otherwise, you don't touch it. Same thing for the spleen. If you go through the spleen and you see a nephrostomy through the spleen, you don't touch that nephrostomy. If the patient is hemodynamically stable, you just leave it there for a couple of weeks and then pull it out. Keep in mind that the interventional radiologists on the, on the liver side, they do transhepatic biliary surgery and they go up to 12, 13, 14 friends. So don't be afraid. If your patient is hemodynamically uh, in good shape, no worries. This is an image that you should never forget. This is an image of a punctured kidney with a stone in the renal pelvis upper ureter. And what you see as an extravasation is not extravasation, it's a duodenum. So the actual increase in pressure inside the kidney created a fistula with a duodenum. In this case, the only thing you need to do is put a nephrostomy and stop the case. Do not try to negotiate, to dilate, to put wires down the ureter, whatever, because if you make that hole of the duodenum bigger, then you will create a cripple, and these patients do very bad. They go in the intensive care unit, and most of them die. So just put in a nephrostomy tube, come back after a couple of weeks, everything will have been dissolved. Sepsis is not an issue a lot anymore. This used to be in the books, but now we're using low-pressure systems. So it means in this case, for example, you saw a 30 French dilation with a 26 French scope. It means there's, there's four French of space that the water goes in, passive water goes in, and passive water comes out. So we work on low-pressure systems. So sepsis, in my experience, is higher with our ureteroscopy cases than with our PCNL cases nowadays. This is a very interesting case showing why you need to do CT scans always before. And you should not, uh, you should not um, depend on an ultrasound and think that with an ultrasound you can find it. So this guy comes with a renal colic inside the office. And you see with the ultrasound a nice stone inside the kidney. You do a KUB and an IVP. And you realize there's a strange anatomy of that kind of stone. But it's still you see the ureter going down and you, you plan you plan to do a PCNL. Now, if you don't do this, you will never realize that this is not a stone of the kidney, but it's a, a calcified aneurysm of the renal artery. And you'd really have huge issues if you go in. So you just need to do a CT scan always, otherwise you could be in trouble. This is an extreme case, but it's a case. It happens, so you have to be careful. Take home messages again. The only surgeon, as I said previously, that has no complications is the guy that doesn't do surgery. Become familiar with your complications, and familiar means you discuss them with your colleagues and you learn how to manage them. Complications can happen to anyone, experienced or novice, and you know, be prepared to handle the situation. Whatever kind of experience you have, just standardize everything in your head and you need to know what you're facing. So again, concluding everything, I would like to say that the key to success for any kind of procedure, prone, supine, laparoscopy, whatever, is standardization. If you standardize, you can reproduce, you can teach. You can teach in a safe way, in a safe and efficient way, and you need to follow those basic steps. First, you learn how to do it, and then you change it. 
If you don't like what you learn, then you can change it. But first, you, you replicate what you learned. You stick to one procedure you learn, and then you replicate it. Thank you very much. So now, let's see if we have any questions. Okay. So one question is, why don't you use balloon dilator? Um, the balloon dilator is, uh, first of all, as I told you, we do multiple accesses in the kidney. So the balloon dilator, um, you need, it's quite cumbersome to use it for the second access. The second biggest problem that I don't like about balloon dilators is the balloon dilator needs space between the stone and the calyx. And if you have an impacted stone, then you don't have that space. So you, you have to inflate outside of the kidney and you cannot push in afterwards. So your dilation is outside of the kidney. You have to find your way in. So that's, uh, that's one of the reasons I don't like it. How to puncture the papilla by ultrasound? Can I do direct puncture to the pelvis? Well, whoever does uh, ultrasound punctures, most of the times does not go through the papilla. So you can go to the pelvis, not doing a pylostomy though. It depends what you want to do it for. If you want to just put a nephrostomy tube inside because the patient is in sepsis or because the patient has a dilated system, you can go anywhere you want. Nothing will happen. But if you're planning to dilate, then you need to go through parenchyma. So if you rotate the C-arm or if you use the ultrasound in 30 degrees from the midline, you go through parenchyma, as you saw in the presentation. So if you go through parenchyma, there is no problem if you go to the pelvis directly. Another question is, what is the benefit of nephrostomy? Is there any possibility? Uh, what is the benefit of the nephrostomy? The nephrostomy gives you, the main advantage of the nephrostomy is that you have access to the kidney for the first postoperative day. So if something goes really bad and you don't have access to your kidney, you have sepsis, for example, uh, then what do you do? So that is a big problem if you don't have access to the kidney. So the nephrostomy is positioned there mainly have, to have access to your kidney if something goes wrong. How often can things go wrong? They could go wrong. It's like, you know, I, I always say, like, the reason why you wear a belt in the car is because you wear it. So if you have an accident, it will save your life. That's exactly the point. Another question, um, is there any possibility to do balloon dilation only on ultrasound control? I have, you did it ever. I have never done it, but I suppose it is. The Chinese, for example, are doing, uh, they are doing, they're not doing balloon, but uh, they, you can still, you can still uh, do a balloon um, thing under uh, ultrasonic uh, guidance, I think. Uh, PCNL in obese patient tricks. Now, an obese patient is obese in the front part. So if you do a supine procedure, obesity could be an issue. You need to position the belly. You need to put them inside. If you are in prone, obese or non-obese makes no difference because you're on the back. All of them are the same. So it's not an issue. The, obese. the only reason why you would need longer dilators and longer scopes is for horseshoe kidneys. Some of the horseshoe kidneys are positioned, positioned more centrally. And what happens in these cases is you need longer dilators and longer scopes. Um, if cost is not an issue, what do you think of retrograde puncture? Retrograde puncture means that you put a, a urethral catheter with a needle inside and you puncture. I find that this is an old story. It started in Canada, I think, many years ago. Um, but I don't favor it. You don't know where you're puncturing. You, you might go through the wrong... If you go through an anterior calyx, you really come out very anteriorly. So I know people are doing it. I don't have experience, and I can, kind of feel uncomfortable uh, doing it, I must tell you the truth. Preferred needle size. Uh, the needle size is 18. Uh, I use a diamond tip uh, 18 uh, needle. Uh, a lot of people use a 21. I like the 18 because it's stiff and rigid and it follows my commands one-to-one. -one, so that's why I like it. How far up do you place the urethral catheter? Inside the pelvis or the proximal ureter? No, it has to go well inside the pelvis or the upper calyx. You need to be able to overdilate your system. In the ureter, it doesn't overdilate your, your, your system. So please place it inside your pelvis easily. Tubeless PCNL, my experience, no experience. I don't, uh, I don't prefer tubeless PCNL. First of all, what is tubeless? If you put a double J stand inside with no nephrostomy, is this tubeless? I always standardize, I either leave a malecot tail or I put a double J stand and a nephrostomy. If you put a double J stand and a nephrostomy, the nephrostomy comes out the next day. So I don't see any benefit why I don't put a, a nephrostomy tube inside. 
if I have a complication, sepsis or whatever, I have access to the kidney in the postoperative time. So for me, it's, it's, it's a rule. Percentage of bleeding with non-papillary PCNL, exactly the same as you have with papillary PCNL. It has been published in a prospective randomized trial. You can have access to the PubMed and check it out. I always said, if I would have more bleeding with this technique, I wouldn't be doing it because you know, I would have more complications and I wouldn't have patients. 50% of my practice is stones and you know, uh, we teach all, a lot of people doing it and whoever comes and sees realizes that the bleeding uh, is exactly the same. No more chances to have bleeding. For lower pole puncture, do you need to make a grand caudal tilt? As you probably noticed, I'm not a big fan of the lower pole. I try to negotiate the lower pole from the middle axis, bending my scope down, because the lower pole is very mobile. So that's why I don't like the lower pole. Uh, would you routinely insert a double J stent with a balloon nephrostomy if a malacot was unavailable? Yes, I would. In impacted stones, dilation is difficult with balloon. Why not the same with polymeric? Because the polymeric has a gradual opening and you go face on the stone. So you actually open partly the calyx in front of the stone. You might not be on the stone directly, but you have a minor opening and it's pushing in. The balloon is going lateral. It's dilating lateral. The polymeric is pushing in. So you find your way much easier with the polymeric right on the stone than you do with the balloon. Um, are there precautions for obese patients? Not particularly, no, no precautions. Tricks for performing bullseye puncture. The trick is rotation of the CR 30 degrees to you, vertical for the depth, that's it. Pediatric PCNL tips and tricks. The only tip and trick that I would say there is you really need to go down with the size because pediatrics is, you know, you, you need to use mini PCNL there. There's no doubt about it. This is the main indication for mini PCNL in my, um, in my world. I don't have experience with, uh, with kids. I don't like operating kids, but, uh, you know, it's logic. You need to go with smaller diameter scopes. Which position you prefer, supine or prone? Clearly prone. Supine is good in good hands, yes, but I find prone, I do everything with prone, so I don't understand why I cannot, I, I will change my procedure uh, to something else. I have access to all my calluses with a prone, so I have no difficulty. So I do, as I said, prone. Pediatric PCNL. If you have stone fragments after PCNL in the ureter, in the ureter, when you do second procedure, in the ureter, if I have fragments, I go down in the first setting, with my flexible uh, ureteroscope, integrately and uh, break the stone and flush them down the bladder. I don't do a secondary procedure. I do it at the same moment. What kind of shockwave or ureteroscopy? So if I have remnants in the kidney, then I do shockwave or ureteroscopy, depending, I discuss it with the patient, and depending also on the texture of the stones, whether soft stones or hard stones. If the soft stones, I do shockwave. Do you use occlusion catheters? No, I never use occlusion catheters. I'm afraid they will damage the UPJ. So I, I, I want to work with low pressure systems. I do not want to, to occlude the system there. So I, uh, I, I really use open end um, catheter and nothing else. Uh, let's see, because the questions are flowing in. Uh, bleeding rather than problem. Is the central puncture has more bleeding rather than the papillary puncture because of the infundibular vessels? No, they don't. Books are saying that, but in reality, that doesn't happen. Believe me, you have to see it to believe it. Try it sometimes when you have difficulty to go through the papillary axis, go more immediately, and you'll see that it's exactly the same. No difference. Do you use occlusion? Uh, we said that. In horseshoe kidneys, do you puncture upper calyx? This is the only calyx you can puncture in horseshoe kidneys. The other calyxes are hidden by bowel, so the only accessible calyx that you can go in for PCNL is the upper calyx. How to control hypermobile kidney? So first of all, if you, the, the easiest access for hypermobile kidney is the middle calyx. This, is, this fixes the kidney, so you can actually puncture the middle calyx, fix it, and then if you want to go to the lower pole, you puncture the lower pole. But if you have a hypermobile kidney, the lower pole is a bad place to go. So middle calyx access, fixing with your wire, would be the perfect thing to do there. I do PCNL on lateral oblique position only with ultrasound. What is your opinion about PCNL only with ultrasound? Fluoroscopic free completely is something that I, I would never do, but I know the Chinese people are doing it. So, you know, if you can do it safely and correctly, it's fine with me. Any available fellowships in your center? 
We have regular fellows in our center. You can find my email uh, online and uh, communicate with me, or it's, my email is liatsikos at yahoo.com. Communicate with me and we can discuss about it. I do please, uh, um, any of ever. Do you see any difference about puncture technique, bullseye, and triangulation about blood transfusion and bleeding? Triangulation is a very vague concept of describing the puncture technique. Uh, we used to do that, do that when I was doing my fellowship. Triangulation goes through the parenchyma and then you bend and you create bleeding. The bullseye technique goes directly at the spot when you want to go in, so it's clearly the way to go. Bullseye is the way to go. Triangulation is a bit different and more meticulous and more, I would say, bleeding prone. Do you have experience with supine PCNL? I tried it. I've tried a couple of cases. It did not convince. It's not fitting my needs. I, I mean, I know other people love it, so I cannot say it's not good, it's not bad, and the literature has proven that it's the surgeon and not, not the technique. But I feel confident. There's nothing I cannot do with a prone technique, so that's why I'm not changing it. Do you need ipsilateral loin elevation to 30 or 45 degrees? No, we don't. Sometimes lower pole puncture is very steep with upper impossible to put guide wire in ureter. This is exactly why I don't like the lower puncture, the lower pole puncture, because if you want to go through the, uh, down the ureter, you need to use Kumba catheters and the Cobra catheters to start negotiating to put the wire down the ureter. And, you know, I don't like that. Um, do you have access with monoplanar uh, experience with monoplanar access? No, I don't. I don't see why one should do monoplanar access. If you don't have a rotating CRM, use your ultrasound for the other access. Thank you for your informative lecture. If you have complete staggered stone due to the stone volume occupying whole calyx, you could not pass guide wire. What is your tricks and tips? The, the biggest tip and trick here is that if you have a staggered and you have a and you puncture more immediately as I, as I showed and the trick is that during your puncture you need to ask your nurse to over dilate the system if you over dilate the system you create this couple of millimeters between stone and calyx with contrast inside at that point you have your needle inside the trocar of your needle is you push it on the stone so when the nurse injects you just minorly retract it and advance your wire guiding it towards the pelvis most of the times the wire passes down because, as I said, it's like a scaffold that guides the wire down the ureter. So most of the times, the, the, the times that I don't manage to pass my wire down and probably the times where there's a high insertion of ureter with a dilated pelvis or a UPG obstruction and stuff like that. Uh, do you routinely mark the ribs and anatomic gland marks before punctures? No, I never do it. If I need to go over the 12th rib, no problem. If I need to go over the 11th rib, then I never do it. So if I need to access the, the upper pole over the 11th rib, I will use a flexible ureteroscope or deal it with another way because the chances that you will damage the pleura are more than 50%. If you go over the 12th rib, then it's uh, something like 10%, 5% to 10%. What about mini perk? Mini perk has clearly indications. Uh, I wouldn't go with a mini perk, for example, to do a staggering calculus or a big calculus. Uh, for me, it's very important to decrease the time of surgery into logic times one, one and a half hour. I'm not the guy that would do PCNL for three hours. I think this increases your complications drastically. So mini perk, what is mini perk? I, I do, for example, we in our department, we do either conventional, which is 26, 30, 26 scope, 30 uh, sheets or 18 scope, 20 sheets. And we do that according to the diameter of the calluses we see when we inject contrast. So if we see a very small pelvis with very narrow calluses, we'll probably go down to 18, 20 sheaths. 18, why 18? Because I can still use the ultrasonic lithotripsy. Do I need to go with smaller scopes and then, you know, use the laser? Only in very, very selective cases where everything else is not possible. And, you know, it's, it's, you need to be able to do everything, but it's not something we do all the time in our department. Um, approach to impacted PUJ upper ureteral calculus. Uh, so if you want to do upper ureteral calculus and it's impacted in the ureter, uh, interesting approach is also laparoscopy. Uh, so if, if the stone is really impacted and is big, you can just go laparoscopically, cut the stone out. If the ureter is not good, you actually cut the ureter and you reconstruct it afterwards. So you have no stenosis.
Using laser lithotripsy when my second question, non-papillary puncture, it seems to me you puncture the pelvis. How do you perform? So uh, laser lithotripsy, you have to use it when you use small scopes. There's no other choice. So that's it. And uh, the papillary puncture, pal puncturing the pelvis. Yes, you're right. It's puncturing the pelvis through parenchyma. How do you perform? So it's not a pilostomy, to make it clear. Pilostomy would be straight, not at 30 degrees, straight down to the kidney. Um, how do you perform combined procedures with flexible ureters in prone position? Very easily. You have the ureteral catheter inside. So once you have the ureteral catheter inside and you, you pass your wires, uh, you just advance your scope over the wire and it goes very easily up, very easily up. Some people, the American school, they actually put the patient in prone and then they, they do the cystoscopy. We don't do that in our department. We do the cystoscopy in supine, put up the ureteral catheter, then we turn prone and uh, we advance our flexible scope up or the sheath or whatever. Have you considered using ureter access sheets up to the UPJ to maintain low pressure and facilitate passage of fragments? Uh, we've, we've done this with mini scopes where we're dusting stones and we can't take them out. So yes, we've put the uh, access sheets, small access sheets up to the to inside the pelvis and we are fragmenting the stone and flushing them so everything goes down. So this could be, this could be an option, a bit exa exaggerated, but yes, we've done it and it works, works nicely. Do you prefer alkene dilators? <clears throat> no, I prefer the polymeric ones, but it's again, uh, it's just a personal preference. It doesn't have anything to do with whether it's good or bad. I know a lot of people that use alkene dilators. Which kind of device do you use for stone disintegration? I personally use uh, the EMS Lithoclass Master, but now there's also two companies, EMS and Olympus have perfect uh, ultrasonic uh, combined uh, excellent probes, so you can choose either one. Either one. The important point is that you need to aspirate the stone. You need to be, be able to suck the fragments out. Do you have any advice for supracostal puncture of upper calyx? Supracostal puncture, as I said before, over the 12th rib, go easily. If you go over the 12th rib at the end of your procedure, ask your anesthesiologist to auscultate the base of the lung. If you suspect anything, call for an X-ray on the bed. And if you see that there's MO, uh, pneumothorax, put a small pleurocaf inside while the patient is still asleep. No one will notice, nothing will happen, two days, then you take it out. What about one-time procedure for both kidneys? No, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. I don't want to risk bilateral complications, then you're really in deep problems. I don't see the reason why. I know people are doing it, but I don't want to risk. What if there is no access to flexible nephroscope for an accessible area? Second puncture, manipulation. Second puncture, yes, or flexible ureteroscope going... Uh, you know, retrogradely, or you puncture, or and if the calyx is small, uh, you can go with a miniscope there. You can really go with a miniscope, fracture the st stone with a laser and flush it in, and you can pull fragments off through that, the, the bigger dilation site that you had. When the kidney is high in the chest, is it advisable to put a pillow beneath the chest to push the kidney down? No, I don't think this makes a big difference. If the kidney is high in the chest, and you have access to the lower calyx, then you're doomed to go through the lower calyx. You have to do that. Uh, are there any cases of situations where you would prefer laparoscopic pilotomy and retrieval of kidney stones to PCNL? For pilotomy, I wouldn't say so. Um, I, I do laparoscopy on upper urine, ureteral stones or lower ureteral stones, very big ones that are impacted where the, the ureter you see previously but even if you take the stone out endoscopically, it will be a stricture there. So I kind of combine, combine the treatment of the stone with the reconstruction of the ureter. What if ureteric access sheath is used rather than ureteric catheter? Why? Why should you go with something bigger than a ureteral catheter? Ureteric access sheath risks of damaging your ureter even minorly, so I don't see the advantages of that. Uh, do you do two-channel PCNL, puncture two calyx, leaving wire and the letter separate, or just use flex through the... No, I can do two. When I do two axes, uh, I use two axes, and then I drain one of the axes at the end. Uh, anatomy of upper calyx, you elevate the flank. What about immediate shockwave after finishing? No, immediate shockwave after finishing PCNL, I don't see the reason. 
I check for remnants afterwards, some remnants, and uh, then I plant it after the, the kidney size healed. How much angle to manipulate in kidney when you puncture the infundibulum and directly to pelvis? When you go to the pelvis and you go more medially, the angle towards the lower calyx is very easy. Unless the angle is very acute, most of the times you, you, you reach the lower pelvis very easily. If you, you, and you judge this when you see the retrograde pilogram. When you see the retrograde pilogram and you see acute angles, you don't do it. If you see a big, nice pelvis that lets you move inside, then you can do it very easily. Um, encounter past during puncture, proceed or another day? Now, this is a good question. If you have one stone occupying your pelvis, for example, and you puncture and you have passed, then you put an ephrostomy and you stop. But if you have a stagone calculus that you puncture one calyx, you see pass, you put an ephrostomy there, then the other calyx will be full of pass again. So what we do is we, we proceed to very fast to clear a cavity where we can put a double J stand inside, uh, uh, an ephrostomy inside. So <clears throat> depending on your experience, I would say that if you have a stagon stone, you need to proceed, send the culture, send the urine for culture, so you know what kind of antibiotics you will give, because if you put it in a frostomy tube there, it will still not drain your kidney. If you have a stone, though, that creates a hydronephrosis, a unique hydronephrosis, and you see pus, then you drain it. Calicil diverticular stone, PCNL tips. Thank you. So calicil diverticular is a strange entity. Uh, many times you need to do a combined approach with flexible ureteroscopy on PCNL. So the problem is not to go in the calicil diverticulum and take the stones out with PCNL. The problem is to find the communication with the rest of the system. Sometimes you can't find it. So uh, what do you do in those cases? You just burn the urothelium. You take out your cautery and your roller board. You burn it and, and you go out. And uh, the, the, best, the best thing would be to find your communication. So that's why you could use your flexible ureteroscope and have like a rendezvous kind of technique there. Um, in different calluses, do you need for three or four punctures? Uh, no, you, if you have different calluses, then, you know, with one puncture, you can deal with the pelvis and the lower calyx. And then if you have stones in the upper calyx, you can do a second puncture. But then if you have minimal other, other stones in other calyxes, you have two choices. One is to use your flexible ureteroscope. The other one is to finish your case come on a second session and deal with a flexible scope, those minor stones in those different calluses. You will have less bleeding and you will do a very efficient job. Now, remember, do not extend your procedures for more than a determined hour, you know, an hour, an hour and a half. Put a limit because the more you go, the more complications you will have. So uh, I, hope, I hope the whole thing was uh, self-explanatory for you. Uh, thank you very much, guys, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Bye.